Hi, Michael here. Welcome to the 6809 Coder Lab. Today I'm going to take a look at the motherboard for my favorite retro computer, the Tandy Color Computer 3, or Coco 3 as it's known. Here's a case for that uh, machine we'll be taking a look at. The case itself is in pretty rough shape actually, but uh, I don't uh, need this because I'm pulling the motherboard out for a project. I'm going to repack this in another case. Fortunately, while I was wiring up an external power supply, I managed to blow up several chips on the board, so now I'm in the process of repairing this computer. A little bit about the Coco 3. It was introduced in 1986 and is the most advanced of the Coco line from Radio Shack. The original Coco uh, never had the following of uh, Commodore 64 or, or Apple II, but Radio Shack uh, is believed to have sold about 2 million of these machines. So there were a lot of these out in the field. There's a lot of families who got these for Christmas, and a lot of kids, like I was, uh, learned to program on these machines. They actually weren't very good game machines, and the fact that the users had to do a bit of programming, uh, I think is a really a reason why a lot of Coco users turned into programmers uh, or got into IT like myself. So I'm going to give you a tour of this, and I hope you like it. So this is the TR-80 Color Computer 3 main board. This particular one that I have, I'm actually repairing right now. So I've done some modifications to it, but I figured I'd uh, give everyone a little bit of a tour uh, while I have this thing apart. So essentially, there's a, it's a pretty simple computer. It's 128K, expandable to 512K. There's actually people out there who have built two meg kits and even more by doing some fancy addressing. Uh, but from the factory, it was really a 128K out of the factory and then an option for uh, 512. The system itself is based on a 6809 processor. Uh, and this right here is the 6809. The 6809 is famous for being sort of the uh, best of the 8-bit processors. You know, there's going to be some people who watch this who will object to that. But if you look at, uh, you know, the capabilities of the 6502, uh, which was really quite primitive in comparison, and the Z80, uh, the Z80 had some nice things in that it has a faster clock speed, but uh, overall functionality, uh, 6809 was superior. And back in the good old days, we used to call it, we were uh, trying to be snobby, and we were always competing against the, the Apple people and the Commodore people, and we would say it's not an 8-bit processor, it's an 8-slash-16-bit processor processor, which is uh, debatable nowadays, and let's face facts, doesn't really matter. But hey, when I was a kid, that was really cool. Um, so starting at the processor, here it is. It's a 40-pin unit. There's essentially uh, 16 address lines on it. There's eight da data lines on it. The uh, other pins that are on this processor are, you know, for power. There's an external clock. There's actually two clock signals that are used. There's a Q clock and an E clock that are used on this processor. Um, and uh, that's essentially the brains of the operation. Now, the Coco doesn't really, you know, have any support processors for graphics uh, that are significant or sound or anything like that. So really everything is happening on that chip. Uh, you, you don't have a lot of external devices helping it out. So it's constrained by that chip, which is a pretty common design back in, you know, the 80s. But uh, nowadays, of course, you would have support chips and the CPU is actually, you know, one, just a small component of the overall system performance. Next door to the 6809 is a 74 LS245, I believe. Uh, this is a buffer chip that buffers the the address lines uh, from the chip itself. So it provides amplification for those address lines, provides a bit of pr protection for the chip. Um, next to that is the interface for cartridges. So this is where you plug your cartridges in. Also a disk drive a controller will go in there, anything else will go in. Now as you notice, there, there's only one of them on this board. So uh, to expand the Coco, we would use something called a multi-pack interface. A multi-pack interface basically provides these same output lines, except they're, they're buffered across four plugs, plus they're selectable by software. Um, on this, you can pretty much access every, every single important uh, line uh, signal on the uh, system. So your clock signals are there, your data signals are there, your address signals are there. So you can actually do some neato hacks if you really want to by working with this. You, it's, it's essentially a full 
exposure into the system itself. Underneath, we've got the uh, ROM chip. Now, I've removed this ROM chip, and I've got another video up that I just put up that uh, is showing me testing the ROM chip. I'm actually repairing this board, and uh, the ROM chip uh, that I've tested is bad, so uh, I've pulled it out for now. i just got a socket sitting there waiting for a new ROM chip. This big component here, this is actually uh, the heart and soul of the Coco 3. Now, there was a Coco 1, there was a Coco 2, and there was a Coco 3. And the, the Coco 1 and Coco 2, basically, they only supported 32 character wide screens. They had a, a, an older video processor, 6847, I believe, which was a part of the, the Motorola kit. Um, but the difference, the key difference between like the Coco 1 and the Coco 2 is just, just a change in the form factor. There was uh, less chips on the Coco 2, it was cheaper to produce. Uh, different case, it looked different, of course. There's a different style to it as it, was, as it was built, but it wasn't really improved. The Coco 3, however, was a big improvement on those two other models. But what is really doing all the work for the improvement is this chip right here. So this is a, a, a Tandy custom part. Uh, if that part is blown up on your Coco 3, uh, you got to throw away the motherboard because the, you know you really can't obtain these anywhere else. No one else used them. Uh, I'll turn that around. Uh, it's the brains of the operation. So basically, uh, it's generating all your clock signals now. Uh, it also has video generation in there. It uh, on the Coco 3, you have the ability to display 80 by 2025 text which was a huge feature back in the day for us, at least. Uh, we thought that was very exciting. It has the ability to generate the VGA, sorry, not the VGA, the RGB signals. Uh, it also has the ability to address banks of memory. So this is how you can access the 512K. The 6809 processor can only access 64K, but with this chip, it allows banking of those uh, 64K blocks and it banks them in, I believe, 8K uh, chunks. And that allows you to do bank switching in order to access, a, you know, 512K or like I said, uh, two, two megabyte people have done upgrades. They've built upgrades for it points in the past. So it allows that flexibility. This chip here is essentially the difference between a Coco 3 and a Coco 2 or, or, or any of the previous ones. Uh, everything else is very similar. So this is another um, a buffering chip between this and the... Uh, the uh, uh, bus on the system itself. So that's just a small, you know, uh, 7 4 series logic chip. It's pretty straightforward. If we go a little bit more to the uh, left here, these two guys here, uh, 40 pin units, these are uh, uh, 6821 PIAs. So the CPU itself is not like a, like a microcontroller that you have today, like an Arduino. It doesn't really effectively support the addition of external devices so you know your your keyboard your serial port your whatever you really need a support chip in order to manage that stuff so the PIAs are that's what they do uh, and in a lot of respects what they're doing is they're adding more pins onto this chip so it can access more more um, more actual data more more devices uh, this one here PIA, its primary purpose is to manage the keyboard. So your keyboard uh, matrix is plugged in here. This one here manages uh, your joysticks and and um, uh, I can't quite remember the, all the other functions of this PIA. Now, for some reason on these boards, one of these chips is a 6821 and one is a Tandy custom part number. What I've read online is the Tandy custom part number doesn't seem to have any different difference to this than the 68. 21 so I've replaced it with a 6821 on this board and I, I'm hoping that it works uh, these two chips here one is a, a logic inverter and one is a, another buffer chip not very exciting so here we've got the main system memory these are 41464s uh, this is 128k RAM these are a bit of an oddball part uh, not available anymore uh, you can buy them on eBay. I picked up a whole set from China and just took six weeks to get, but uh, they are not, you know, standard chips. They never were that popular as far as I know. And nowadays they're even less so. So, you know, if you blow these up, you're looking at a bit of a lead time in order to get them. These logic chips here are uh, 74LS244s 
and they are used in the addressing of the RAM. So we have signals coming from the GIMI chip and they come in through these here and they direct the uh, signals to the correct RAM chip and or to your 512K expansion interface if you have it. Here we have a little relay. The relay is a common, if you've had a Coco, you know about the relay, the, the clicking sound when you hit reset, there's always this reset click of the relay, which is uh, you know sort of a sound that you know as you're growing up because you're always hitting reset, trying to reboot it when your program crashes. Now, on the far left of the board, we've got our power supply. It's a pretty straightforward power supply. Now, I've wired a Molex plug so I could put this in a, a PC case because I didn't like the Coco case and this part of the project is I'm repacking in, the, in a, a PC case. So these wires wouldn't be on your normal Coco board that you get out of the, out of the factory. Uh, this chip here is a regulator chip. So it's part of the, the regulation. The transformer for the Coco puts out about 16 volts AC. So that raw power needs to be converted to five volts and uh, to 12 volts for the system itself. This chip here is your serial interface. It, it basically provides a, a negative 12 volt and positive 12 volt for the serial, serial port. Um, a couple other functions in there. These two chips are Motorola chips. They are uh, also basically end of life. So if you need new chips for this, you, you have to purchase them online. Fortunately, I've tested these. I don't think I need new ones. Everything seems to be fine power wise and uh, uh, serial port wise. So that's basically it. On the back, we've got a couple of joystick ports. We've got our serial port, we've got our cassette port. The joystick ports use a, a, a pretty simple digital analog conversion. Uh, it gives you eight bits of precision. Back in the day, we would try to use those for all sorts of you know exciting little projects, measuring rainfall or trying to measure temperature. But with only eight bits, there's only uh, so much you can do. The serial port is what's called a uh, what we call the bit banger. Uh, it is really only good for about 1,200 baud, maybe 2,400. There are people who've programmed this, you know, in very specific cases to do higher speeds like 57.6 or, or even higher, uh, but they're using pretty slick programming techniques and that sort of code didn't exist back in the 80s. It was really, you know, over 1200 baud. You need to get a external RS-232 pack, which you, you plug in there and you could use that for your modem. Here's the cassette port. The cassette port was, uh, the, you know, where we started out. Most of us, uh, the disc drives back in the day were, you know, 300 bucks or something like that. And that's, you know, the equivalent of 600 now. So uh, most of us started out, you know, except the rich people, uh, started out with using a cassette deck, which was a nightmare because it didn't really work very well. But it wasn't that slow. So the cassette deck on this was 1500 baud, which is... <laughs> To be honest with you, pretty close to the same speed as a Commodore 64 disk drive. So, you know, other than the fact that it wasn't, a, a, you know, a direct access device, it was a sequential access, uh, it, it was pretty, you know, usable. What you can do now is you can use uh, your mobile phone or, you know, any MP3 player in order to uh, replace a cassette deck. And that gives you a much more reliable sort of read, read and write of data. So you can use this for, you know, other purposes nowadays that back in the day we couldn't, we couldn't do. There's an RF modulator, so it has a, a TV output. This particular model that I'm holding, has, it's all rusty, it's in bad shape, and the RCA plug's broken off, which is probably why that computer was so cheap when I bought it. And then at the very end, we've got our video out, we've got our audio out here. And we've got the famous reset button. So now let's look at the underside of this board. Basically, you know, nothing exciting on this board. This is a, you know, 1984, 85 vintage. It is just not very exciting at all. Uh, it was designed to be, you know, as cheap as possible for the market. Um, 
the one distinguishing thing it has is here it has an RGB connector. This is for your external RGB monitor. Most people who had a Coco did not have an RGB monitor because that was a, a very expensive option. You can't just plug a regular VGA monitor to these plugs or just use some wires or something like that because the scan rate is, is a, a bit rare. It is not really supported nowadays. So uh, you, you need to buy an up converter if you want to connect this to a regular VGA monitor. And yeah, that's about it. I mean, this is a pretty basic 128K computer. You can do a lot with these things. Uh, I'm going to use mine as a, you know, a, a little BBS server, maybe an OS9 server. Uh, it's only, you know, 0.89 megahertz when it's running in slow mode and, and 1.8, I guess, in, in turbo mode. Uh, so it's not very fast. But, uh, you know, uh, for toying around, it's lots of fun. And also, because it's so simple, it's something where I can actually repair it myself. I can uh, scope out uh, through the traces and I can figure out what's wrong with it and uh, fix it. I can understand the whole system. It's a lot of fun to play with. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna continue on my uh, process of repairing this board and I'll let you know how it goes. Thanks for tuning into my channel and uh, I hope you found this interesting or educational and I hope uh, you'll come back and visit me again. Have a great day.